four, and, and we're, we're live. live. All right, welcome everybody to another episode of All Things 3D. It's Wednesday, November 19th, 2014. We have a special guest on our show today, John T. Hurwitz. He's an incredible artist who's joining us all the way from... From we... England. Yeah. All right, from England, all right. So UK, and uh, I'm your co-host, Chris Kopak. Hi, and I'm Mike. I'm hanging out in the in a needle right now this morning with my little friend down here. Can you see my little <laughs> he's friend? In, he's in, There's my he's in the eye of the needle. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, so yeah, we'll get right started. And uh, John, so Jaunty, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your name, where you uh, where you're located, and what you do for a living? Um. So, well, my name is Jaunty Hurwitz. I am. Located in the UK, I'm actually South African, but I live in the UK now. I live in the countryside, in a beautiful, quiet spot on a river. Um, and what was the other question? <laughs> oh, and what are, yes. What, what do you do? What do you do, John T? Uh, well, I am an artist. I'm an artist, and um, I suppose in a nutshell, what I do is I'm I've, I'm I'm an engineer. I've always absolutely loved technology and science and physics and um, uh, maths to, to, you know, to some extent, although I'm not a kind of super mathematician. And I search the world for amazing technologies, amazing techniques, and then turn them into art. Yeah, and you have this time around, which yeah. is really interesting. Yeah, so really interesting. I, uh, yeah, I kind of noticed. I went through your portfolio and a lot of yeah. the videos, as well as your website, and I noticed that you seem to kind of have a trend, as you just indicated. You love technology, and it shows in your your artwork. Uh, yeah. In fact, you know a lot of your artwork. Actually, I can show you behind here. It is some of the stuff, and you know, I, I noticed kind of a trend there. You use different. Uh, uh, you mentioned some that you use three D printing. You use different polymers, and even you paint representing voxels, which I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, so uh, maybe you can kind of tell us a little bit about that, and and where did this come from? These ideas that you have. Do you know it's it's always an interesting question when people say where does an idea come from? You know, it's 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 such an interesting thing. I mean. I, um, you know, like like many of us of this generation, you know, I always loved computing. You know, I remember the first Apple computer coming out when I was maybe 11 years old or something. Well, I remember I got an Apple II, and my recollection of life has been um, working in technology. And and I suppose. I found a way, being a creative, I found a way at a very young age to get deeply involved in expressing myself through technology. And, and over the years, that's, that's, that's evolved into becoming a sculptor and I suppose, importantly, find, finding a way to um, create pieces that uh, other people can enjoy, you know, rather than just being a techie, sitting in a computer, creating another algorithm for... Um, a big corporate, you know, and so, but the question as to where the creativity comes from, I don't know. It's hard being an artist. You wake up one morning and decide that you need to change the world. Maybe it comes from ego, you know, I often think that artists are ego-driven, um, and my way of expressing that is through through the use of code, I suppose. Yeah, you so so pure code. So the the the, the I I had a chance to uh, kind of take a look at uh, some of your art, which is just incredible. And um, here uh, here are some of the projects. Um, this one really caught my eye. Obviously, um, this one is like uh, basically you have reverse engineered the lighting right. pattern of uh, uh, you know like a 3D like a hand an image of a hand or, th or a 3D sculpture of a hand the way that it pro would project from a cylinder and you've basically reverse engineered it and made a uh, you know uh, the abstract version or the projected version so that when you put a, a cylinder a, a you know a chrome cylinder a reflective cylinder in the middle of it the hand is not distorted. So, um, so I, I guess we're really curious. You know, we're 3Ders. We work in 3D software every day of our life. This is our passion. Um, we live this stuff. 
what is the software you're using? Are you are you um, coding this up like by? I mean, are you coding it for project specific, or are you using tools that are already available? Um, well, actually, um, um, for this one, I've worked with an amazing guy because actually, do you know what? It's been a long time since I actually wrote code myself. You know, I've been in in the industry a long time. I think actually, as a coder, you need to be quite young. I think it's almost like an athlete's game being a coder. And yeah. so um, I've worked with an amazing team um, and coded up um, the algorithm. And actually, it took a it took a while to do that. Using MATLAB. Oh, okay. Yeah, familiar uh, with it. Yeah, using MATLAB, and so the algorithm for distortion was done in MATLAB, and um, and then beyond that, I mean, I use all the standard 3D. I mean, standard 3D tools. I mean, the tools that I absolutely love are um, ZBrush, Cinema 4D. Um, um, I use MeshLab. Um, I use a lot of Photoshop. I find Photoshop amazing for coloring and texturing. Um, I, and, you know, and, and just all the Photoshop all now has has 3D tools. So Photoshop's got amazing 3D tools now. I really actually enjoy Photoshop and and actually find coloring and texturing, which I do a lot, quite difficult on the other packages. I mean, ZBrush, I adore that software, but I've never really got my head around the. Um, the coloring and the texturing in ZBrush. I just haven't managed to work my way around it. Um, yeah, I use a product called 3D Coat. Have you heard of it? Yeah, and, you know what? Everybody talks about 3D Coat, and I um, I downloaded it. In fact, did you email me about 3D Coat as well? I, I can't remember. Anyway, loads of people have told me about it, and I did download it. And then I thought, wow, do you know to do you know what it's like to dive into a new 3D package? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's yes. like learning an entire new language. Right. And, like uh, you, I, I keep meaning to get in 3D code, but in the meantime, Photoshop, I'm so familiar with it. It's come such a long way. Um, I'll get into 3D code at some point. You know, I, I just hard. keep... Yeah, I mean, you know. It's hard to get into something new when you uh, when you're when you're still refining your skill in the tools that you're you're already familiar with. Exactly. I mean, and you're always refining your skills. You know, these things are so big these days. These packages are so big. I mean, even in the 3D world, you know, you're either a lighting expert or a modeling expert or an animator or you know, and and I mean there's a there's a whole world. And so yeah, 3D codes, I, I will do it. I will do it eventually. It's like you're a you're a brown belt now in Taekwondo. Oh, but did you want to get into karate? Yeah, exactly. It's exactly <laughs> that, you know. And I suppose to, and I suppose to some extent you can I mean, you know, it's not that you can't like get into karate and get to brown belt within a few years, but it's still a few years, you know. Right, right, right. Yeah. It's, you know, so on okay. on to the next question and you're pretty much answering it now. Uh, obviously, you feel that uh, software and hardware engineers can be artists as well. Would you agree with that, John D? Oh, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think this is my big subject at the moment. Yeah, especially inspiring young people now. You know, I think. Um, I mean, you look at everything from the games industry to the film industry to special effects to just what's going on in the science world at the moment. I mean. I don't think there's a human on the planet at the moment that doesn't kind of wake up in the morning, look at the newspaper and go, whoa, the world is moving fast. Today it's a nano sculpture in a needle, tomorrow it's something else. The world is running at a pace at the moment and that's all down to creativity. And, and I think what we've done is we've boxed things. You know, I'm at art school, I'm, at, I'm learning science, I'm at engineering school and immediately the kind of perception of what one does gets boxed as well, whereas I'm completely interdisciplinary in the way I approach things, and I think many, many people are, and you know, what's the di what is the difference between art and science? I actually don't know. And I yeah. totally agree with you. There's I think I kind of... There, isn't there? Yeah. It's not a hard, it's not a, this is art, this is science, and what is science a lot of times, uh, you know, there's this whole classification of uh, what they consider uh, fringe science, and a lot of people can uh, confuse what's fringe science with pseudoscience, which is totally separate things. Uh, precisely. And, you know, and fringe science is actually like the science, that's the frontier. That's where we want to go and explore more. 
But a yeah. lot of times people are scared because, oh, science is this boundary thing. It's not, there's no boundary. This is like a, it's a growing body of work. And what one person proves here could be disproven here. You know, and it and it's not a it's not a black and white science is not a black and white defined by the institution or academia in any yeah. way. And I think a lot of times okay. lost. A lot of people they go, oh well, university taught me this, and so that's mm -hmm. what science is, and that's what's the truth. And no, that's this is not that's not the truth. the The university is wrong in a lot of cases. You know, and no, totally. And and you know, it's quite interesting because I think. People who go into the world of science, firstly, you get a particular type often that's attracted to science that is quite rigorous in their thinking. But I mean, I think people in science generally come to understand that even what we call the laws of physics are not absolute fact. They just represent right. our observations of things, you know, Theory. within a particular frame of reference. But 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 you have the vast majority of the world that aren't involved in science that just hear about it and consume that have actually almost confused science and religion and, and are starting to see things as absolute truths, you know? Right. And, yeah. and even within the science world, I think it's, it's, it's very locked. I mean, I, I've, very, I've got a very interesting, um, interesting take on this, you know? I, 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 I mean, this is separate from the art, but I've really been pondering this whole idea of dark matter and how the galaxy works, you know? And, right. and I found a really interesting, actually this is how, one of the reasons I got to the nano piece. I found a really interesting professor in, um, in the Weizmann Institute in Tel Aviv who has got an alternative theory of gravity. So he sure. basically says gravity doesn't work at all how we think it works. His name is Professor Milgram. Um, and actually if we just change our understanding of gravity a little bit, it would explain how the galaxy works and, and it would basically right. explain away dark matter. And, and I went to meet him and, and he just said, I cannot, I struggle to get the traditional science world to even consider that I might have something because they are so fixed in Newtonian gravity as Newton discovered it, you know, and so we're fixed everywhere. Anyway. Um, yeah, that's on to the next question, I've got some of your work behind me. I've noticed that a lot of the work is based on slices. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, I, I, do you know, I think there are two reasons for that. Um, the one reason is because I use a lot of technology in the work I do, and we live in a binary world, I suppose, and so, to, so to some extent, kind of, the tools at my disposal are a bit slicey, for want <laughs> of a better word. Uh, do you know whether you're slicing like a three D package or you're slicing, you know, do you know what software's like? Like cut and paste, like generally comes in a rectangle. Do you know what I mean? And then, yeah. um, and three D printers print in slices, and I, and so that's my excuse in, in layers. You know, that's my excuse. I think it's probably to do with the limitation of my own imagination, frankly, and um, and definitely after this interview, I'm going to um, give a lot more thought to how to de-slice my art. I love this. No, I, I think it's great. I, I think it's different. Um, but yes, I think we should all expand or change, you know, things up so hopefully we're spurring you to do something else but don't <laughs> yes. go don't go back into the real uh, I, I like this and, and then I'll see if I can find some in a moment because I didn't really talk about it not only do you do the, the slicing that I have here but let's see I don't want to get into your nano stuff just yet see if I can jump to it uh, there we go uh, you use voxels and invertices and, and mm. triangles in order to represent things. Now, let me ask you a question. When you did these, um, did you draw these out or did you take meshes that uh, from an existing package and then bring these in or mm. did you literally draw these line by line? It's a good question. And, and you know what? I, I have this interesting 
dilemma, just to, to step back on that a little bit, I'm, I must have been approached now by five or six master's students, one or two PhD students in science, in art, in mathematics, actually maybe even more, saying, I'm trying to write the algorithm for this, I'm trying, how, how, what's the algorithm, you know? And, and, and of course there's an element of secret sauce about it, I'm not denying that, I quite like the kind of slight mystery, but, but actually a lot of my, in fact every single one of my pieces has an enormous amount of hand crafting about it, and, and when I say hand crafting I mean Photoshop, I mean ZBrush, I mean, you know, where you sit down with a pen on, an, on a Wacom tablet and you make. And, and so those pieces, and those pieces are the ones that really take the most manual labor. They are an enormous labor of love, those mesh-based pieces, because um, generally I will take the meshes, so, so the way I do it is I'll do a scan of a person, because I always like working with a scan. I think it gives you something that 3D characters just don't give you. You know, when you go and see a 3D f a film, there's just something, there's life missing, and so I always start with a scan. And then just use amazing, I, I use me, uh, MeshLab quite a lot because there's just such funky um, algorithms for re-meshing. Um, and then I eventually I find a mesh that I really like, bring many meshes into Photoshop and then just sit there for an untold number of hours like deleting lines, joining up, hand painting, eventually putting these on a canvas and hand painting them, so it's a massive, those mesh ones, what the voxel ones or the mesh ones are just a massive labor of love, frankly. Well, yeah, and, it look, and it looks like it. Go ahead, Chris. One of, the, one of the nice things uh, that I, uh, you know, I run a, a digital fabrication shop, so I run a bunch of 3D printers, additive manufacturing machines in my facility oh, cool. here in Central California, and one of the things that's really great is you know, versus traditional fabrication is that if you traditionally fabricate something like for, a, like I work on my motorcycle all the time, I'll do a motorcycle, pe I'll, if you fabbed it up traditionally, you'd ha if you wanted to go and recreate that, you'd have to go and refabricate it up. But the beauty of having it in the computer now is the fact that you can just call it up at any second. If you want to modify it, it's super easy. and. Okay. And so you can you can actually use economies of scale kind of to your advantage. You can offer, you know, maybe a something that you would traditionally manufacture. You could offer it at half price, but you could get it into, you know, ten times as many people's hands in the same period of time. So with art, are you finding that that's the same thing? Are you are you able to like uh, basically manufacture more of these pieces of art to put them in either more exhibits or put them into more people's homes now? I mean, are you using totally, the company? Yeah. Totally. Although there's a, an, an interesting sort of paradox, or, or not a paradox is maybe the wrong word, but an interesting issue that's coming up now. You know, um, as an artist selling sculptural work that, that, that is digitally inspired, number one, the traditional art world, certainly the art critics, really struggle with the concept. They're like, so you didn't actually make this? You actually did it on a printer. I'm like, well, I suppose you could look at it like that. In the same way as a writer didn't make his book, do you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, these people, these people that criticize that, or they, I, I don't think that they quite. I don't, I don't, I think they maybe are. They're again, they're caught in the paradigm that we were talking about earlier. They're yeah. caught in their box where art, art is like a religion for them, where they mm. have boundaries on what is and what is not art. Totally. So to me, a car is art. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree yeah. with you. And that's and, all designed on a computer. You know, and that's and that's why I asked if uh, you thought that software and hardware engineers were artists as well, because obviously Absolutely. they impart their design uh, in in the objects that we work on a day to day basis, and uh, mm. so. I totally agree. So let's kind of move on into the heart of this interview, and that is. Trust. Uh, I, I, you, know, you have to watch your video before you understand why you use the word trust, and then you have to listen to the what would you call it? The underlying <laughs> background uh, music to really understand why you use the word trust. So I am going to ask right now. You must be an X Files fan. Yes. 
I was an X Files fan. I was an X Files fan. I was. Yeah. And actually, the amazing um, Fred Atkinson, who did the music and actually edited the video, I have to give you know you. I know you can ask me about credits later, but while you're bringing it up, I have to give Fred credit for for that one. <laughs> Well, it was fun. X-Files every night, I, uh, my girlfriend and I, we watch X Files every night. So we're we're still big fans. <laughs> it's funny. I didn't even know it was still going. Is it still it's going? Netflix. You can watch the whole no, thing. It, yeah, if it, if you have Netflix in the United States, they have oh, okay, the whole yeah, series. Yeah. So it's like like many things. It's gone into syndication, but it's the new modern syndication, which is running things on Netflix. So you can. Uh, I do you know what Netflix is in the UK as well. I I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm 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 a member. Good. Okay, so let's kind of move on to Nano. And yeah. essentially, from uh, what I've gathered, and I've done a little research on it, plus of my own experience working with stereolithography printing and also photogrammetry, I also work a lot in 3D scanning myself, which is what kind of perked my interest in this. Mm. Um, because I'm familiar with the camera setup that you talk about. Yeah. But essentially, you're using photogrammetry, and, mm -hmm. and I'll just simplify it to laser lithography. Um, we know that it's much more complicated than that and uh, in the show notes I'll have a couple of links out to some videos. Um, right. I'm pretty sure it's either this group or, or somebody from the group, very young guy, talks about 30 minutes on the whole process that uh, you talk about in your, your own website uh, briefly on how the process works. But uh, you know, I, I guess the first thing, and you kind of describe it in the video, so I'm not going to go into much detail here because you've already talked about it before, but you, you had the, the impression that, uh, that wouldn't it be great, and this was my opening scene, to create some, something so small but so detailed that the naked eye can't see it, but it's still there. I, you know, maybe kind of uh, enlighten us a little bit of your thought process here. You know, why, why create a piece of art that you can't see? In fact, we'll get to the, I'm not going to give it away now, but <laughs> there's a little bit more to the story. Not only can you not see it, but it may not be there anymore. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you'll have a more positive answer than your video uh, when we get done with this. But go ahead, please. Uh, you, you know, uh, you know I, 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 I suppose to start out with, I, I always find art takes itself a little bit too seriously, frankly. I, as, as do scientists. I mean, any professional, they get to a certain point in life and they just take themselves too seriously. And, and so it's actually quite hard to find art with a sense of humor, frankly. Mm -hmm. and, and there's one aspect of looking at this piece and going, well, where's the sense of humor in that? And, and so, you know, you go out into the art world, and I was kind of mingling with all the kind of art professionals, and everybody's saying, you know, the next phase of your career is scale. That's the next phase of your career. Because, you know, I've been making, every, making everything at 3D printer scale, right? So I come home and I'm like, shit, I can't actually make things with my hands. <laughs> I don't know how to make things. With, how am I going to make things at scale? And then suddenly I realized that, you know, the actual scale, the concept of scale I could, I could challenge. Um, and so I suppose that's where it came from. It came from a desire to sort of shake the establishment. I think that defines me as my greatest strength and weakness in life. It's like I, I have this need to shake the establishment and... Um, and so, and so this emerged, and I started looking around, and and you know these things are much less um, sort of academic or, or or deep than one might imagine. It was like woke up one day and went, oh cool, wow, what about tiny? What about minuscule? And I got on the internet and started phoning people and doing it. You know, just just do it, just you know, like Nike Nike's um, strapline. You know, just yeah, do it. I mean yeah, I mean, if you need to solve a problem and get it done, especially yeah. in a timely manner, you got to take matters in your own hands. Yeah, exactly. And so then it was, you know, just, just get it, get, get going. And 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 Michael, I forgot you, you. You there was another part to the question which I've lost track of. Um, let's see. We'll get to that in a And let me find. Uh, well, is uh, here we oh, go. So Hang on a second, yeah. Chris. Oh, okay. here we go. So essentially. Um, the first part of the question is you used a technique that's extremely mm. cool right now and then and we're going to actually did I did an interview with somebody from Artec who's that's now serious. created their own photogrammetry booth based upon their technology and then mm. I'm going to be doing an interview next week with Dube 
who's created something similar to what you have here, but refined into a booth. Um, mm. Both of these products are 100000 plus in cost, mm. but mm. the reality is you take a look at this image behind me, mm. there are what, 60, 120, how, how many I think, I think they're between 200 and 250 cameras there, I can't remember. And, and these are all high-end DSLRs. So mm -hmm. $1,000, $2,000 a piece. So it's easy to do the math. This is a very expensive setup. Um, did you go out and buy all these cameras or no, did you have somebody? No, no. no I, I worked with a guy in, in the UK with a lab who, who, who's got a lab. Um, and um, yeah, I, I worked with a lab in the UK. And I can, I'll, I'll tell you the guy's name. It was amazing, Lee Perry Smith. Um, and he's got an incredible setup there. Uh, which which is being used for the games industry and the films in film industry at the moment. You're right. It's a very cool technique at the moment, and Lee was amazing because it was quite um, a challenge being being naked. You know, I, I I mean, you know, for me and for for you, both, it was it was a challenge standing there. It was quite cold. It's in a big warehouse, and Lee was absolutely incredible. Yeah. And so then, what 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 happens? Sorry, I'll let you get on with the question. But no, um, so essentially, we're both familiar with photogrammetry, and I'm mm. actually designing a lower-cost photogrammetry system based on iPod touches. Um, and we also did a discussion with somebody who has another four or eight camera system. So mm. we're seeing the cost come down, but the advantage of it, as you're probably aware of, is that mm. you get extremely detailed textures, which you're not using here, but you can also get an extremely good mesh them. from I have it. Got them. I have got them, yeah. And uh, and I wanted to talk to you about that later, um, maybe off off this interview. But uh, with that being said, uh, you have taken essentially a high detailed mesh mm. and converted it um, mm. using some tools. And you mentioned in your video is a a Russian based company that created the photogrammetry tool. Do you totally remember Agisoft. That? Agisoft. I'm, I'm sorry. Say that again. Please? Agisoft PhotoScan. Okay, and I'm very familiar with that, and it's very reasonably priced, and they're uh -huh. making some pretty good—I wouldn't say pretty good money, but they're—they're they're really getting out there as a as mm. a good uh, piece of photogrammetry software, and many people who are creating these lower end systems are starting to use it. Uh, but as you did indicate, it does require a fairly beefy machine because unlike standard scanning type techniques, you are literally uh, going through and determining in 3D space where all these images align, so it's very uh, computer intensive. And, as you're probably. And, and I think, I mean, I mean, just to to add to that, I think my experience with photogrammetry um, certainly, I mean, you know, I'm, it's just from this project, but it's been a big project. Is the, the amount of work that you then need to do on a on a piece once you've received it? Once once the photogrammetry system and I, I use the very high-end ones, although that was a high-end studio, but Agisoft isn't, I, you know. Um, the, the amount of work then required to re-sculpt the whole thing is enormous. I mean, I mean, photogrammetry is far from being point and click. That's right. a very good point, uh, Jante, because I am, you know, a lot of people said, uh, and even with standard 3D scanning, there's still a lot of work mm, in the background. And, and Artex says that they have figured that out and that they've got mm. foolproof systems that they can pretty much make a turnkey system based on their scanner to give you a perfect image. And mm. I'd like to see that, you know, seeing is believing, as they say. But as you indicated, it's still a lot of work to create a good mesh. I mean, so, massive amount of work. And, and actually, interestingly enough, just a f tiny little quirk for the kind of 3Ds out there. But, and and uh, it just made me think of it, but you've got this on the, the screen. But so I think that there are two things I wanted to say about photogrammetry. The one, one thing, the beauty of it is, is that it can capture a moment, which all the laser scanning ones can't, you know, where you have to sit there for a It doesn't capture a moment. Photogrammetry really does capture a moment, which is beautiful. Do you um, remember what the time frame was? I know that the dube system claims one one hundredth of a second. Do you remember what it is uh, for this? Do you this know what I, knew. I never knew. I can find out for you if you like. But, okay. um, uh, but obviously it's really quick and... Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a snapshot, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and but but interestingly enough, if you can flick back to that other piece, just to put a sense on 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 
I suppose what's involved in a piece of art, the, the one of Cupid and Psyche. So, so um, you can see that the angel, which is actually me in that picture, is, is flying, is floating. And that was almost impossible to, to capture. And, and actually the, the, the size of the photogrammetry, the, the area, the, 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 the sphere that it was capturing wasn't big enough for two bodies. It's actually surprisingly small. Uh, the area and so the amount of work to a change the position of the angel you know because I, I, I couldn't float like that in real life I wish I could but I couldn't <laughs> and, um, and, and, and keep the whole thing real and then also have to paste together do a couple of different shots and then paste them together afterwards in order to be able to get that amount of space if you know what I'm saying two human bodies going out it's a lot you know it's a lot of work but great fun and so in in real so this this sculpture here uh, you know mm. that that you're using uh, you're using multi-photon lithography right to, to yes um, so this, this is probably this what the size of a grain of sand yeah, or let's we'll get into that minute in just a Chris uh, geez, sorry Chris we'll get into <laughs> that just a moment. Is huge, so finishing up on the the photogrammetry in this particular case you um, use photogrammetry to capture yourself as well as the model, and then composited them in what tool? Uh, sorry, the, the compositing. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, for compositing, I use a bit. I mean, I use ZBrush. I use um, Cinema 4D. I use MeshLab. I use NetFab. I mean... Whatever you know, works. Whatever. whatever wor and, and generally, not one does one thing. You need all of them. You know what I mean. It's okay. So... I'll let Chris ask the next question, which is the important thing. All right, you've captured these things, which a lot of people are, but you've done something different. You have put this into a scale that, you know, we we have to tell people when we print things with what we're working with, you know, oh, it's it's like the, the it's as thin as a human hair. But uh, yeah. let me let me go back to my own image here, so you can see, or maybe I'll just show it here. This is a little object I created of my wife. I did a full 3D scan using the structure sensor and my lens system. Yeah. But I printed it out, and it's about, uh, I don't know, four or five centimeters uh. with some details down to 50 microns. Uh. But you literally, in 50 microns, or about 100 microns, created a full detailed figure that you see on the screen behind me. So that's the difference. This object here is about three to four, no, I'm out of screen here, is yeah, there we go. about four centimeters, and the item that you have there would fit in her hand. Uh, so it's incredible to imagine what you've done here. So Chris, go ahead and, and, and ask so, the question. So this sculpture, showing, we're, we're showing it on screen for the listeners that can't uh, see it. Um, it's a sculpture of an angel floating over a woman, a naked woman, it's beautiful sculpture. Yeah, beautiful it's based sculpture. on a, a sculpture that's known through history. And you want to tell us what it is, yeah. Jonte? Uh, well, it's um, it's a sculpture in the Louvre uh, by Antonio Canova about Cupid and Psyche, and it's um, and 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 it and it shows an image. I mean, um, this this is just an interpretation of it. This is this is me and and my partner, but an image of Cupid, the myth of Cupid coming and and. Kissing Psyche. There's a beautiful legend about um, um, Cupid being uh, Psyche being very beautiful, and Cupid's um, um, piercing himself with his own arrow and actually falling in love with her. And this beautiful love story. But he's a demigod and she's a human. And you know, one of these beautiful, beautiful myths, I suppose. And so it's all based on that. And myth being a very important part of it because. The sculpture in itself is almost mythological because I think really importantly there's no point that you can engage with it without the intervention of, of um, digital technology really. Um, so you have to see this through a screen. You cannot see it with a human eye and, and I suppose you could build a lens strong enough. It would have to be very big and I, I'm busy researching that at the moment. But Yeah, I, mean, I was going to yeah. say that would be... That'd yeah, be, otherwise... Like an enclosure... Uh, Thing. Okay. It, so it would have to be a very big lens, yeah. So let's. You the know, size we're, we're, of the sculpture itself is about what the grain, uh, the size of a grain of sand. Or? No, no, it's much smaller than that. I was asking myself that same question until I saw it, man. And I have to say, it came to me as a shock. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the exact size because I think this puts it in perspective. Do you oh, know? That's not a human uh, arm. That was oh, a fly's oh, head. Uh, yes, that's a, that's a no, that's not a fly's head. That's an ant's head. An ant's head. head. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
That yeah, and an ant head, for those of you, is about, what is it, about 50 nanometers, uh, 50 microns, and because I just measured it. And so this is the figurine on top of its head. And this is to scale, correct, Jonte? This is to now, scale, yeah. Yeah. Now, obviously, and correct me if I'm wrong, you did not get the electron image that you have here with the ant. These were composited later? They were composited, yeah. Okay. They were composited. I had to do that. Like there was an element of guilt, because I'm sure there are there 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 people out there looking at it, going, "Oh my God, this was actually done on an ant's head." And, <laughs> and um, well, and you I did a good thought, job. Your shadowing is fairly accurate, so <laughs> hats off. I, I um, look for stuff like that. Yeah, no, I, I I do think it's um it's well shadowed actually, but 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 I think I had to because. And I need to answer the question of scale because when I was telling people about it and showing people the images in an uncomposited way, I couldn't communicate how small these things were. I had to right. find a, a way of communicating it because otherwise it just loses its beauty. But I wanted to put it in perspective for you how small it is because it's really important. Do you know on a beautiful evening when the sun is setting and suddenly you'll get a ray of light coming through in your, into your house? through the window, and suddenly, in the ray of light, you'll see that there's dust in the air, which you, you previously didn't notice. Do you, know, do you know what I'm saying? When you get yeah, like the light. little particles coming in. Yeah, you see them floating, or, yeah. You, you see them floating around. That's yeah. how big they are. Oh, my. Yeah, so this thing could, like, blow away if you're not careful. Wow. He has, he has something to tell us at the end of this. Uh, okay, so um, let me jump back to, you know, another scale representation. You have the scale of a human sperm mm -hmm. up here in the, the right hand corner compared to your Yeah. Here. So and this is the reference and you show 10 microns. So even though that uh, I, mean, I mean we have details here that are less than a micron. Mm. I mean that is just you know, Oh no, oh, no. It's insane. I mean I mean I look at it and I'm I kind of estimating that some of the, the finer features are in the nanometer range, you know, 300, 300 nanometer range. Yep. And, and the resolution of the technique that you use here, um, and you can describe it a little bit to us, is mm. about 200 nanometers, so that would make sense. Yeah. So go ahead and talk about the, the science behind this now, um, so that we can quickly wrap this up. Okay, well, I'm uh, not a grandmaster at the science, um, but I can... I can tell you the, 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 I can give a nice overview. So, so basically you get certain polymers that are sensitive to ultraviolet light, that harden in ultraviolet light, basically like a glue. So for those of you that go to the dentist, it's a very common one. Dentist puts the filling in, glues it in, turns on an ultraviolet light in your mouth and the glue hardens, right? So you have resins that harden at, at, at um, ultraviolet frequencies of light. The problem is that, that you can't get a very, very highly focused beam. And so what happens is at different frequencies of light, I don't know what the frequency of light is, a highly focused beam is shined into a kind of glob, a very tiny glob of this resin. And it so happens, and this is, this is getting into the quantum physics level, that at some point in, in every um, voxel on this, on this sculpture, two photons arrive at a particular point in space at exactly the same phase. And uh, as these two photons come together, they create a high energy event which is disproportionately higher than... Um, do you know what? People who know a lot about it are going to be hysterical at my explanation, but I think it's a good kind of pledge. Yeah, it's a good yeah, John T, if you see in the background, I found a YouTube video that will describe yeah. what you're doing. So just, do you see it as well? Yeah, I see it. Okay. It's a, you're, you're, you're doing great. It's, <laughs> yep. a, it's a primer. Right. You know, we don't expect right. you to get so into this. When these two this. photons come together, when these two photons come together, they create a high energy event. Now, this is two photons, guys. We are in quantum physics land here. <laughs> two photons of light create a high energy event, and that high energy event is enough energy to harden a two or three hundred nanometer volume um, of, uh, of this resin. And then what happens is the beam stays focused, um, the, the actual globule gets moved along, can you imagine, and the next voxel along gets hardened, and so it works, like a 3D printer. 
Yeah. Well, and if you watch the video here, which is done by one of the scientists or researchers that you probably had communicate with, young guy, um, he talks about his principle. But the other important thing, and then you probably will agree with this, John, T, is that the monomer that uh, monomer that is used yeah. is unique. Um, this couldn't be done with any normal UV resin. This is a special monomer that works with infrared. And as you said, when the two photons excite, that's what hardens it. So it's a combination of chemical engineering as well as uh, physics that have, have allow this technique to and work. And incredible optics as well. I mean, just yes. to get a beam to focus. I mean, yes. So a lot of things, if I remember correctly, this first occurred in 2012. Is that right? Uh, or at least the, the the papers and, and this video was at least created then. And some of the things that I found on the web, other examples of uh, 3D objects was about 2012. Is that about right, Jante? I'm, I must say, I don't know the history of it at all. I don't yeah. know the history of it at all. I'm, I mean, I think just, just to stress, I mean, just may, maybe to, uh, although I'm not giving you the science maybe that you were hoping for on this, uh, do, you, do you know, for me, any of these projects that I'm involved in, involve a huge team of people, all super specialized. This is no different to making a short film. And do you know there were two universities involved, science departments involved in the creation of this. And, and I don't think any individual knows the other. Do, do you know what I mean? We all rely mm -hmm. on each other. I think any great creation needs a team. No, um, I think, and that's why I wanted to differentiate. You use photogrammetry, which in itself is a science. Yeah. And then you're using the stereolithography, uh, this two-par, this two-photon polymer technique. These mm -hmm. are all on the edges of it. And as you indicated, you are the director. You pretty much synchronized a lot of this in order to create uh, the, the objects that you created. No, not uh, hopefully I'm, I don't mean to take anything away from you. No, no, the no, science okay. that, you, that you indicated is well established. Yeah. It was a good, as as Chris said, a good primer, and it, it did a good job. Um, yeah, that car is amazing that you're showing. I love that one. These are my yeah. favorite. I just have to say, John T, we really appreciate you coming on and taking the time with us. This uh, my my favorite art nowadays is interdisciplinary. interdisciplinary yeah, that's beautiful. Art. And and what you've done is you've taken you've taken a piece of technology over here and a a piece of technology over here. And you just joined them together, and you're making all this beautiful stuff, and <laughs> thanks, man. Lines and and you're doing a great, you're you're just doing a great thing. Thanks, man. Yeah. So let's then, let's jump yeah. back into some more of your images here. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and you have names for these, and I apologize if I don't intensity. remember the title of them. What is this one called? That one's called Intensity. Intensity, which I I like the what you did to the bottom of the 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 legs of this one individual, it almost <laughs> looks like they're coming up from a primordial state. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that was the intention. And then you've got some notes here. Let's see if I can, I'm almost through with it. So how many actual uh, models did you get created? So in the end there were seven, seven models created. Okay. And, um, and these were all in a little mirror box that you you. Yes, they were in a little mirror box. You asked for me to, to show yes. it to you. Um, I got it. I've got it. One second. I'm going on a tour of John T's place right now. <laughs> well, yeah. it, what's it's fun is because you you mentioned in your video, and I'm thinking, okay, I can picture this in my mind. It, yeah. It's kind of like a Pandora's box, a mirrored box, which I think would be. Yeah. Well, oh no, it's just okay. So, can you see it? So that's. Well, event, when, when it was shipped, it came in. You can, it came in a, a uh, huge box, <laughs> and there were layers and layers and bubble wrap, and yeah. um, you know. Yeah. And then eventually, we got down to this little box over here, which so it looks like a chip uh, carrier, as they call uh, just it. Just a little plastic box, which opens up. Don't sneeze. Uh, I won't. Well. Let's go ahead and get to the story. We don't really need to worry about it anymore, right, John? No, I want to see this. <laughs> Not really. There we go. Because there's a fingerprint on it. Because the key word here is, oops. <laughs> exactly. The key word here is oops. They don't so, actually exist any longer. <laughs> so they what had happened, exist. and I'll, I'll paraphrase with John T just to get. So, actually, John, why don't you quickly tell us what happened? So you were able to obviously scan and create the images, but then something happened, and kind of get to that real quick, and then we'll end it. <laughs> oh well. Um, so 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 you know the first round of the first round of sculptures were made, 
Uh, Stefan Hengsbach, I've got to give him a credit, and his team at Karlsruhe University did an amazing job. Um, and, then, and then eventually it came to me, and I found an electron microscope reseller in the UK who was willing to give me time at a reasonable rate, actually free, but he absolutely fell in love with it. He was like, please, please, please can I have one of these sculptures? I've been photographing cancer cells for 20 years and this is just the most beautiful thing of it. I was like, look man, I'm sorry, but, you know, come on, these are, but I'd still appreciate your time. Anyway, I go along there, we put it into the into this electron microscope, which explains why some of the images look different, because it's different scanning electron microscopes. Um, and, you know, after an hour of shooting, he wants to change the angle of the glass. I hear, oops. I'm like, okay. We go on looking. Suddenly, we can't find the sculptures on this piece of glass. I mean, you can imagine looking for a sculpture this size on a piece of glass of, say, two centimeters by two centimeters is trying to look, is like trying to find, have you ever tried to find Mars with a strong telescope? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's very difficult. difficult. So it's, it's literally, and we just couldn't find them. And basically, he had touched it. He had put his finger on the center of the piece of glass, and all seven sculptures have gone missing. Oh. Well, tell us a good story here that somebody, you've gone back and you now have another set of sculptures, models, yes? No, I don't. Do you know I, what? I, I've I, got a good one for you, John no. I've got a good one because you just, you just totally inspired a new one. Is yeah. You need to, uh, now you just 3D model a haystack and put yeah. that in the eye of the needle. <laughs> a haystack in a needle. <laughs> Do you know what? That is really good. I really like that. <laughs> it's like searching for a haystack in a needle. That is so cool, man. I really like that idea. <laughs> Just go with it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, do you know what? So, they are not left, but I'm, I'm, I will remake them. I will, and, and, you know, coming back to one of our original points, that's the beauty of this modern world. I will remake them. They're not the originals. Um, and really what I'm wanting to do next is get together a, a beautiful exhibition which hopefully can go around the world um, um, on, I don't know if you've heard of those Musion screens, those giant like holographic screens. Mm -hmm. and I can envisage people coming in, seeing nothing, putting it into the electron microscope and then what they see in the scanning electron microscope being projected onto a oh. massive screen. Because I'd love people to experience this. I mean, just like you asking how big is it, I don't think you really appreciate the achievement of humanity until you zoom in on this nothing. Wow. Okay, well, that gets to, to my last question for you, uh, Jonte, and that is you're exploring this from an artistic perspective but also being engineer. Where do you see this going, this type of microscopic uh, nanotype machines? I mean, we're now at, uh, you know, the nanotechnology that uh, we've been yeah. talking about for decades now in science fiction, we're there. We yeah, can we now are. create very complex objects that in the case of the, the researchers you talked about have actually created moving objects with gears now, mm. uh, and a valve system. Um, so, you know, even though you're exploring it from an artistic perspective, the detail now that we can do 50 nanometer type uh, detail is going to give us the ability to take this and and put it in the human bloodstream, or actually create uh, things close to uh, human cell level that we can then modify and put in to let's say uh, take out plaque without having to go in with uh, incisions and things like that. We just inject it into the bloodstream, and there's already been some research where they use mag magnetic processes to guide these things along and move them. So it's it's a real unique world that we're living in. It's, it's so, unbelievable. So Jonte, go ahead and finish up. Um, where do you want to take this all? Um, obviously you've been, as you said, it's gone viral. You've got a lot of people that have been talking to you. You've had a lot of articles out there. You know, yeah. you've you're causing people to start thinking again about something unique and I, I really appreciate that and one of the reasons we had you on. So last words to you, Jonte. Last words to me, really, I, I, I suppose it's just to say to people out there, you know, 
keep going. I love what we're all doing together. Humanity, look what we're managing to achieve together. Let's come together, keep making amazing things, and be creative, and um, keep going, humanity. We're yeah. doing okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, yeah. So, so... And where can so we where can we find your work? Can we can we can we uh, check your ex? Do you have any exhibitions going on, or where can we see see some of what you do? Do you know at the moment I haven't got any any exhibitions. I'm a bit of an internet person, you know. A lot of it's on the internet. Sure. Actually, I'm just coming out now, so I'll I will keep you guys posted. And I hope um, you're on the west coast, right? Yep. Correct. You're in California, you said so. I hope to be there very soon. With actually, I have had a few pieces up in California, but. At the um, um, uh, the oh, yeah, it's on my blog. I can't remember now. The might still be on there. Is it in uh, San Francisco or LA? Um, I will tell you now. Give me one second. I'm literally jumping on. I think my it was blog. San Francisco. Um, okay. Yeah, the Ruben, the Ruben. H Fleet Science Center in San Diego. Oh, San Diego. Okay. I'm not sure if the exhibition. Well, I was way off. <laughs> yeah. Well, but anyway, um, maybe Burning Man. Who knows? But oh, I'll be in, I'll be in I'll I'll be in your part of the world soon, guys. Awesome. Well, do look us up and let us know, and we'll uh, we would love to have you back on uh, sometime soon. Okay. And uh, his so uh, and his website is jauntyhuritz.com. And that's behind me here. And uh, if you got anything else to mention, John T, about uh, where we can reach you, uh, please tell us now. Um, I, I think for now, guys, um, catch me on the internet. Um, that's where I spend my time, and I will keep you posted when um, I have a real nano sculpture for you to see projected onto a 50-meter holographic screen coming soon. Awesome. Great. <laughs> Thank you, All John. Right. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Thank Mike. Take care, guys. Right. You have a great day. All right. Cut.